Welcome back everybody to your daily update on something, I guess? <laughs> By which I mean the rest of the Ladies' Empire or whatever. We're gonna talk about the White Rose because I finished it last night and we're gonna talk about it today. Book three of the Chronicles of the Black Company and um, I'll guess I might either have something on um, Shadow Games or the Silver Spike tomorrow. I'm not quite sure which one to do first, um, but let me know which one you want to hear about first. That, that seems like a reasonable idea. Anyway, um, let's talk about the White Rose, like kind of the, the end of the first trilogy, what you might call the Books of the North, in a way. I think they're called the Books of the North. I, I mean, I personally don't care. I, I think of the whole thing as like one big thing, so whatever. Anyway, let's talk about it. Um, empires are falling and shit like that. Now that seems interesting or not cheers <laughs> so yeah once again i'll go like spoilery and discuss the whole thing i'll try not to you know touch on too many of the actual plot points and stuff um just more like the structure and things like that so it should work out but once again i mean this is like a 25 year old book you <laughs> you know, I feel like spoiling, spoiling, thing is, spoiling things is kind of difficult at this point. Anyway, let's talk about it. It's once again one something that I really, really love. And it's one of the things I've realized while reading it now again for like the fourth time. It's like it has become something of one of my favorites, my favorite fantasy series at this point, because it is still to this day, it is pretty unique. And... Um, some of that uniqueness we'll see today. It shows up in the White Rose. So what do I mean? After the events of Juniper, the white, uh, Black Company deserting and moving over to the Rebel, finding Darling and uh, so forth. They are now fighting against the Lady. And they have holed up in the Plane of Fear, which we kind of heard about in the first book at least. And a little bit in the second book in um, Shadows Linger. And it's glorious because it's super weird and unique. So the, the main structure obviously is um, we have like two narratives that kind of run, or like actually three narratives that kind of run, one of them runs like, is like sort of like a past one of flashbacks in a way. Uh, it's, it's, it's fascinating from the construction side, is what I'm saying. And we're going to go on that in, in a minute. I mean, it all go, boils down to that big climax um, of the Dominator trying to break out for goods and, um, yeah, stuff happening. And uh, the Lady and the White Rose being forced to, at some point, unite forces to actually fight that greater evil. So that's one of those things that we've spoken about before with the Black Company, is that... There is no absolute, like there is absolute evil, but there's also relative evil, and sometimes you have to choose what to do and so forth. And, you know, questions of morals is something that the Black Company is very big on, and we're going to talk about that in a minute more. So, yeah, that's sort of what we have. We have the three um, plots. We have the Corby plot in the Barrowlands, we have the Croker and Black Company plot in. The Plane of Fear, and we have the Bowman's story, the like sort of biography of Bowman's, how he woke up the lady by maybe mistake or desire and stuff like that, and all of that link, you know, coming together. And that's cool. So, let's talk about the first big thing, the world building. It's still chaotic, it's still not, you know, coherent, or what you might call coherent in, like, what you call modern fantasy, contemporary fantasy literature, but it is so out there, right? I mean, that's, like, the first thing that I feel we should, we we don't give Glenn Cook enough credit for, is, like, this is a story from, like, the mid-80s, and he has flying whales, wind whales, he has walking, talking men here, he has walking trees, you know, all right, Tolkien had those, but, you know, there's weirdness in there. There's a ton of weirdness in here that we don't see in most other fantasy books at the time. Not even today, you know, 
sentient floating whales that are basically living zeppelins is like living airships that's pretty fucking wild out there also with tentacles because tentacles you know <laughs> so that whole thing is just i feel one of those things that glenn cook can do because he has he doesn't have that like really coherent world building that a lot of like other fantasy worlds at this time have or nowadays even have where there's like everything has to make sense and it has to have like a logical background or whatever and he's like no fuck that we have <laughs> i want talking men here's i get talking men here's i want floating whales i get floating whales not your problem i make this shit up because i'm the master of this world and that's great and we need more of that i mean no one ever asked Fritz Leiber why there is the sinking land between Lankmar and Ilthmar that goes down and goes up every, I don't know, how many hours. You don't talk, you don't, we don't, you know, argue about that kind of stuff with like old sword and sorcery uh, pulp stuff, but with like modern fantasy, it has to make sense. There's a logic hole in there. <laughs> how would that work? And, you know, Glenn Cook is just like, you know what? There's a giant tree god in the middle of that desert and. You know, that's all the reason you're going to get. So that's cool. And I, I really can't put enough emphasis on how much I love the fact that he goes all out there and invents, like, all this crazy stuff. And, like, and it's still, like, really cool. So, yeah, there's that. Right, the next thing is... Um, Obviously, the idea that the rebel, uh, that, that the black company now serving Darling as the White Rose in the desert is building up the rebellion, trying to hold up, um, hold out against the, the coming of the comet. Because you remember from like the first book, there is that comet in the sky and it has to be there. And that's when the, that's what all the prophecies say and so forth. So mostly just like sitting around and growing old. And that's... The main theme here, and that's like another thing that we don't get a lot of in a lot of like other fantasy at the time. Now, yes, there is the whole like last couple of books of like Fafnir and Grey Mouser, where those two are getting old, but they're still not, you know, getting old, old. They're still like heroes and stuff. They're just like older. But most fantasy heroes at the time are, you know, young, unless they're wizards. You know, wizards are always old and white bearded and wise Gandalf ripoffs or whatever that druid in Shannara is called. I don't know. He sucked. Um, <laughs> but you know, that's the point. It's like heroes are young and powerful. And what he shows us here in what Glenn Cook once again does is he goes out and just shows like, yes, those are average people. They're not all good. They're not all bad. And they're growing old. They're soldiers in their mid forties, mid fifties, whatever. Um, which goes back to that whole idea that with the black company, you have average people. You have normal people. You, you meet those people, Croker and Elmo, even the lieutenant and Otto and Hagup and all those, you know, those people. Um, they are, they're getting old. They are suffering from being like cooped up there, fleeing from everyone. And it shows, but they're still, you know, they, they do some, doing something that they believe in. So that's how it goes. And that's how it works. Now let's look at the whole idea that like someone shows up in the barrel lands, which is, he calls himself Corby. He's limping. He's badass but he doesn't really show it and if we ever learned a bit about latin we know who he's gonna be it doesn't take too much you know brain power to figure out who he is but once again this is not about like the big plot twist right i feel like nowadays we've become too reliant on plot twists that's not how that works like you you don't read books to be surprised at every like turn Sometimes it's enough to actually, it's, it's better to actually know what the twist is going to be in advance and look at like how it's done. There's like a quote from Terry Pratchett and sometimes like when you go to watch a stage magician, 
you, you know it's going to be a trick, but you go and watch it to see a trick well done. And, you know, Cook pulls it off pretty decently. But once again, you know, he's, we have Corby doing his, like, research stuff, and then at near the end we figure out what he's doing, and then he goes into the barrel land and gets stuck, because, you know, <sighs> shit happens. Bad shit happens all the time. Um, another thing is that third plot line that I like so much is the Bowman's story. Because that one is, like, it's the first time we get, like, flashbacks about, like, the past. We get them in, like, a fictionalized, um, um, like, biography of Bowman's, in a way. And we know it's fictionalized. And this is, like, once again, I don't, I feel we often, like, a lot of people often don't give, like, Glenn Cook enough credit for, like, the literary skills he actually shows there, right? We have, like, the, the, the overall meta-narrative of this being the annals written down by the analyst of the Black Company, in this case, Croker. So what he does is he puts in there the biography of Bowman's Wizard that is totally written by the fictional character Raven who takes an older version of it and elaborates on it and so forth. Near the end, we learn that Bowman's didn't write that stuff. It was someone else that wrote that story about Bowman's. And all of that gets flawlessly integrated into the overall, into the overall plot, uh, overall story. So we have like three or four levels of meta narrative there, which is pretty fucking impressive for like, the Black Company, like for every for anything, but it's, it's it's even more impressive for something that has the reputation of having this like rather like dry and short prose and what. I know Glenn Cook is pretty fucking impressive as an author there. Just saying. So we see Bowman's trying to, um, you know, gain access to the barrow lands to the barrow to uh, communicate with the lady who is still interred at the time to gain power we don't even really learn why he wants to gain power he just wants to gain knowledge and power and he may just be a bit in love with the lady because everyone is in love with the lady and we need to talk about that in a second as well the whole like idea of like being in love with the lady um but um, let's look at, like, he does all of that. He does his bit as a an archaeologist, in a way, like an antiquities-like dealer. So he goes out there and digs up stuff that is safe and sells it to people. And maybe sometimes sells stuff that is not quite as safe, but still, like, sort of on the area of legal, legal because you're obviously not allowed to dig up anything that belongs to the domination, which is the whole idea there. And... Um, Around that we see the idea, and we're coming to something here that I think we need to talk about in a second as well. Because, see, that's what I mean. It's like, <laughs> the Black Company comes across as a rather simple, like, military fantasy, but there's so many layers and facets to it that it's so easy to overlook when you're just like, yeah, there's, like, a bunch of hard-ass soldiers and goofball wizards uh do, doing stuff in a not exactly explained world there's so much more to it and i i love it anyway <laughs> let's let's get back to what i wanted to say all right so there's the idea he's doing that um we see that you know and that's what i mean it's like we have that old threat and this is something that we, as people, should be aware of all the time. And I have no idea if Glenn Cook had any specific threat in mind. But the idea that we, as humans, are apt to forget ongoing threats or buried threats if everything seems fine is a lesson that does not only work for the domination and the dominator in the Empire of the Lady, or in this case, like, still, like, the the place before the Empire of the Lady. It's like, no. I'm not... Yeah, I'm gonna say, it's like, 
look, <laughs> we've been way too complacent about fascism and stuff like that for a long time. I know people on the other side are saying, like, oh, we've been way too complacent about communism. Like, well, forget it. Communism ain't coming back, but you know, <laughs> socialism might, and that might not be the worst thing have ever. But the point is, like, we tend to forget threats, especially after you put down a um, specific evil. A, a, you're not an evil, but yeah, actually an evil. But you, you put down a specific tyranny, whether it's a religious one or a monarchical one or a fascist one or whatever you put down those places like after a while they come back because we come we become complacent it's in our nature as humans to become complacent and that's something that you can see the whole idea of the domination as as a metaphor for right you have the dominator and like half the world ain't taking him seriously anymore it's like yeah well he's dead and we're not you know doing anything about it and then you have a few madmen who are like or mostly madmen who are very much into resurrecting him resurrectionists that we're having there as well plus you have a few people that are just curious and the fascination of evil is something that we see there as well right we as humans are fascinated with evils like there's so many fucking documentaries on on adolf hitler and we're like why do you bother the guy was a bastard and whatever but you know people are fascinated by evil for whatever reason and um, we always have dumb people who think that like getting that kind of thing back might be a good idea for whatever reason anyway you can see that whole thing as something of a metaphor for the complacency of huma humans in general when it comes to um forgetting about past threats and so forth now do i agree with all of that it's like in a general way yes but we have to like so right awareness is what we need glorification of the past is something else um, and there's a little commentary on that in uh, in the black company but at least at this point it's like very much about the complacency and the complacency part is very poignant here But another thing that I really enjoyed about um, the whole, like, Bowman story is, well, both Bowman's and his wife, Jasmine, don't come across as super nice. And since it's Bowman's point of view, which is weird because it's apparently told by Jasmine, you have, like, that old couple. And there's, like, um, and this is, like, one of those parallels that I guess I'm only realizing by now between, like, the Malazan stuff and the Black Company. Both Steven Erickson and Glenn Cook are extremely good at talking about, like, older people or, like, middle-aged to older people and not just, you know, your, your farm boys um, finding rings or magic swords. Which is really fascinating. So you have, like... Even between, like, Bowman's really hating, like, his wife and stuff, you have these moments where he sits down and thinks about it, and it's like, yeah, you you know, how, how growing old changes people, how growing old can, is, is apt to, um, you know, take away a lot of the magic of youth, the magic of love. And there's that, like, amazing point where it's like, inside, he's still that young student, but his body has changed, obviously, and he's trying to break out of that. And that's like, once again, this is like a very good general observation on like how it feels to grow old. It's like your body doesn't do what you want. No. Not for me. I'm obviously still as young as I feel. Um, no. <laughs> Point is, um, <laughs> it's an interesting aspect, the idea that like long-term relationships are a difficult thing because... There's routine that settles in, suddenly stuff that was like super magical in the past just doesn't happen anymore. Uh, things like that. And I'm one to talk, right? <laughs> I got out of that. Anyway, <laughs> point is, um, there's a lot of like very, very human observations hidden in this book that I really, really appreciate a lot because um, a lot of our like fantasy literature of today is very much about not talking about like the, the, the human element the 
the really human element of like what it feels to be a normal person and Glenn Cook manages that in an incredible way also I fear I'm probably just visible as a shadow by now because the sun came out anyway <laughs> you can't change the weather uh, at least I can't um, let's look at more like black company stuff Um, that being. So we have the Bowman story that gets mailed to Croker by Raven. And then Croker goes out to get that stuff. He gets caught. And he comes back to the lady. And here's something that we need to talk about the lady that I find interesting. So first of all, having the lady as the, like, slightly ambivalent but still like for like the first three books the most powerful people in that world are both women now why is that important to mention that i would say nowadays not so much but this is like a book written these are books written in like the early 80s the first half of the 80s Having both your big evil person and your big good person or kind of good person, Darling the White Rose, both be female is a bold move in a way. Plus, and we see more of that going on through the story, that um, both of those are more than just a symbol. And this is, this is what I really respect about it right is that both the lady and darling the white rose are both characters that um, there's like explicit mentions about that, it, but it's also very implicit like they are idolized by people like croker idolized the lady a lot and you have like people like raven and then silent people like idolizing um what I call it a uh, darling and both of those are not, you know, I mean, they, they are using that idolatry. Uh, idolatry is the wrong word, but they, they're using the way that all those dumb males are looking at them. But they are doing their own thing. They are very much using, like, they are just, like, very, they're, they're, they're human. That's the point. Let's break it down. It's like they're just like they're just they're human. They're extraordinary humans because they are like really good strateg strategians and whatnot. But um, that's it. <clears throat> they're the the whole like interplay between um, gender role expectations and them not fulfilling them and um, romanticizing those people and so forth is far more like um nuance that you might than you might think on the first read through of the black company and i i just like want to shout this out because this is like <laughs> this is 1984 to 1986 <laughs> and uh, male fantasy authors didn't really think about that a lot at the time <laughs> and their audience maybe also didn't because the audience was maybe 50, mostly 15 at the time. Anyway, um, not my point. My point is I, I just really find it fascinating to see how that works. We see how the lady kind of shows like human aspects. And then we're going to talk about that later on. If that is maybe a problem. That the lady shows weakness towards Croker and he can be like her her pillar and whatnot and uh, although i think it's done in a decent way because um it's more about like any human warmth she, when she says like the last person who held me was my nurse when i was a kid it's like okay probably anyone would have done at this point um but yeah what i'm trying to say here is that the overall like um like presentation of gender roles of power levels and whatnot is a fairly nuanced thing which i guess is easy to overlook if you just focus on the more like simple bare bones kind of prose that um glenn cook is using here because it's croker writing it and uh yeah 
I just, I just really, yeah, I'm trying to, exp I'm trying to explain why I love it so much. And I, it's something that I get to grips more and more, the, the more often I read it, it's like how much there is in there behind that, like, rather simplistic plot and the plots and those rather, like, those bare bone narratives is like there's a lot hiding in there these questions of loyalty and um even though the lady you know is evil by definition the dominator is even more evil and should you you know throw in your lap with her and like work together and how do you do that and how do you as the you know uh the mercenaries in in the middle how do you like work that thing out also, the whole idea of like Raven, and we're gonna talk about that more when we're gonna talk about the Silver Spike because they will get like a more like specific view on Raven. But the idea of like how stupid individual, mostly male people are when it comes to like emotions and stuff, is something that like goes like winds its way through the entire series and. Yeah, you can just feel, like, when you read The Black Company, you can feel like Blank Cook is someone who has spent a lot of time with soldiers and other men in very masculine or male-dominated fields. And he's smart enough to notice all dumb things that come out of that kind of masculinity, that maybe toxic masculinity, but general, like, overt masculinity i think is a good word for that and he's very very good at like pointing those things out in quick asides with that overall um slightly ironic slightly sarcastic um voice that croker as an author uh, as a writer has as as the voice that fictive a uh, fictional author has and you, we can see a lot of that in the white rose Another thing that I find very interesting is um, we have all that weird shit, right? We have wind whales. We have all that stuff. And there's like a dragon in there. And the dragon's not a big deal. It's like there's one dragon in the entire series. It's coiled around the barrow. It shows up. It tries to eat bowmans, uh, eat bowmans, and it dies. And I'm like, okay, that's interesting. <laughs> that's the most underwhelming use of a dragon I've ever seen. And I, <laughs> I, I just love the fact that for once, dragons are not a big deal. I mean, they're sort of a big deal, but not that much of a big deal. It's like, it doesn't ex get explained where that dragon came from. There's no other dragons in the entire world, apparently. There's one dragon and it dies. And that's it. And, uh, yeah. Um, one final thing that I want to talk about before we end this for today is the idea of absolute evil. And that's this idea that, like, expunging all goodness in a human we're talking about humans here everything there is like humans even though they might you know be powerful magicians or whatnot but there's always they're always human at like the base and the idea that it is very 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 rare that a human being is able to expunge all goodness all empathy all compassion all emotion from itself and just be pure evil the idea that it is such a thing as an absolute evil is important we spoke about that i think or like i didn't talk about it that much but it there's like a discussion about that in shadows linger that there is absolute evil it has to be there for like there has to be like these absolute poles of absolute evil and absolute good for like uh, moral choices to make sense um, but it's very 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 rare that a person can reach like a, a human being can achieve either one of those poles you're n n most of us almost never are like almost always or like a hundred percent good or a hundred percent evil we're somewhere in the middle we're muddled most of the time human creatures are messy all the time whether it's like you know, emotional or moral wise or whatever we, we're messy creatures that's part of like the human condition <laughs> sometimes every i don't know how many millennia someone comes across around is just a hundred percent evil and has expunged everything human and just like 
becomes that moral absolute, which, you know, has to happen for it, you know, to make sense in a way. And if that happens, that moral absolute, the, the fact that it is absolute, requires everyone else and everything else to, you know, join forces against that moral, abs moral, that absolute evil. And that's something that we should keep in mind, because it even means like, you know, the idea is that there is evil in the world, and it is there. It's like, you look out, look out into our world, there is absolute evil out there as well. There is evil out there. And it's important to be aware of that and to be willing to go and do whatever it takes to take down that evil, because we don't want evil to win. <laughs> Which, I guess, is the takeaway from <laughs> the Black Company is that even a troop of mercenaries that is far from good, that is highly problematic in a lot of ways and does a lot of bad things, even those people are able to understand when there is absolute evil to, to fight that evil and to sacrifice whatever it takes to fight that evil because that's absolute evil. And even though you might ally yourself with the lesser of two evils, I feel the point there is that in... Like, real life, the idea of a lesser of two evils is something that we have to face a lot of the time. And uh, that's what we see here in the White Rose. Also, sorry for the terrible jump cut by camera overheated in the sun. And now that I'm back with a cool camera, it starts raining, but I brought myself another beer, so indulge me for the last couple of minutes. Cheers. So, yeah. So, as to wrap up that first trilogy, the Books of the North, um, we see um, the Black Company overall um, first, you know, leaving from a place that is really not good for them, which is burial, where they're like misused and so forth. They take on a new contract, which is with Soulcatcher, to join the Ladies' Empire. They find out that they have, like, metaphorically speaking, come from the frying pan into the fire and um, they do their job which is you know stay to the true to their contract um, because they have almost and it's pretty much clear that they have kind of broken trust uh, uh, broken broken their contract with um, the rule of beryl in a way and they've which kind of forces them to um, stay true to their contract, even though they realize that it's not good for their morals, uh, for, for their morale and everything, to be on on the side of the power, of, like, the, the tyrannical power of the Empire, even after their, like, you know, adventures in the first book. So that's sort of what we see in the second book, um, that being Shadows Linger. Until they are forced to get out of that because of intrigues higher up in the hierarchy of the Ladies' Empire, which force them or drive them into um, the uh, arms of the Rebellion. And uh, they do that until a larger evil, a bigger evil comes up, an absolute evil comes up that forces them to work together with the Lady and her forces to take down the Dominator. Which brings up that idea that some parts of moral morality are absolute and others are relative, sort of, or that an absolute forces like forces perspective on other aspects of what of good and evil, I guess. And they do that. It takes down the almost a part of the entire company, and they decide to do the one thing they have to do. That being to take home the annals, to take back the annals to the um, to Catawar, which is what we're going to see in the next couple of books. And um, that's sort of where I'll leave you for tonight, um, while it's starting to rain around me, because... <laughs> Fuck weather this year. Anyway, <laughs> this is where I'm going to leave you for tonight. Um, the Black Company is on its way. We'll... I'll see you tomorrow, I guess, for either the Silver Spike or the um, or Shadow Shadow Games, and we'll see where this whole thing is going. But the takeaway for me is that, and I'm on my fourth read through, 
The Black Company has a lot more to offer than might be apparent on its surface. Focusing on Glenn Cook's rather, like, spare prose and very um, hit and miss, or not hit and miss is wrong, but like very spotty world building. If you focus on that and apply like modern reading conventions of modern contemporary fantasy, you're missing out on a lot because it does have a ton of incredibly well done like characterization in there in between. It does have a lot of interesting themes and deals with those in the language of the average person. Um, that's sort of like what makes the Black Company is so great. It's it's fantasy written by an average guy, written for average guys, guys being very gender neutral here, like about average people, and dealing with the like moral quandaries we all face in our lives, just like you know hyped up because it's it's still mercenary fantasy in a way. But yeah, that's what it is, and it's pretty unique up to now. It has weird shit and cool characters and I, I absolutely love it and I can't wait to talk to you about The Silver Spike and the next couple of books because they're getting wild. And yeah, I completely forgot to talk about the fact that Cook is using a lot of like magic things to implement ideas that he knows from his military past with all the, you know, bombers and stuff like that with the carpets but maybe i'll you know go back to that <laughs> tomorrow i don't know i don't want to you know stretch it too much but I, I should have talked about that earlier but you know my brain is not good but the point is he uses magical things to um implement parts of you know military technology that we know from our world to put that into place but on the other hand a lot of that doesn't play a huge role in the story, I just wanted to mention that, yes, he does that as well. So anyway, read The Black Company. Uh, although, I guess, if you've made it to this point, you've already read The Black Company. Point is, it's an amazing book. It's an amazing series of books, and I hope you enjoyed it as much as I do. And if you have comments and whatnot, then put them down. And, you know, put your opinions down in the comments, and we can have less, some kind of discussion about The Black Company. Until then... I'll talk to you tomorrow. Cheers.